Good morning, everyone. Good morning. How are you? Um, Jeff Schumacher from the Mob Museum. Thank you all for coming this morning. Um, this has been uh, a great experiment that we've, uh, on two levels. One, it's an experiment, well, maybe three. It's an experiment, <laughs> and first of all, in holding uh, programs in the morning, on a Saturday morning, it uh, looks to me like, you know, from this is our part four, we're still getting good, good crowds that this may be something we want to continue in the future. We have morning people, right? Morning people like to come out in the morning, especially in the summer. No? One exception here. <laughs> Well, we're not doing it at 7 a.m., you know. That's what, um, but um, so we'll see if we start, we might start programming a little bit more in the morning. Um, the other thing, obviously, is it's a series. And uh, we, the first time we've ever done that where, you know, we're doing a, a lecture like you would do at a university. You'd bring in some big, you know, august literary figure, and then they would do a series of lectures over a couple of weeks. This is our version of that. And... Uh, <laughs> well, we're just doing, yes, it, uh, um, but let me ask a question. I think you've asked, been asked this question before, but how many people here, if you don't mind raising your hands, have been to a previous part of this lecture series? Okay, so most of you, not all, but most of you. And is there anyone here who's now been to all four? Wow, again, excellent. So, um, so that's, a, that's a good sign. Very good sign, because you know, people have busy schedules, and you never know sometimes if you're able to come out. Um, we did this every other Saturday, kind of on purpose, so you, know, you wouldn't be like, four straight Saturdays in a row, I can't handle it. Um, well, good, so uh, with that, uh, I want to get started with, by introducing our speaker, whom, because there's so many pin people have been here before, you, you know him. His name is Paul Camacho. He's, the, uh, he's on the board of directors of the Mob Museum. Uh, former special agent in charge of the Las Vegas office of the IRS uh, criminal division. Um, and very, very knowledgeable on the subject matter of this series, which is the, uh, his, his former employer, the criminal division of the, of, of the IRS, and its earlier incarnation, the special intelligence unit of the Treasury Department. And, you know, we do a lot in the museum on this topic, in no small part because of Paul. One, he played an instrumental part in us acquiring a large collection of material about Elmer Irie, the man who's been the featured uh, player in this story. Um, and Paul played a huge part in that. And so we've been able to put those items on display in the museum, as well as use them as research material, not only for this series, but for other things that we've done in the museum. Um, and, and so, as you know, we have a, a big exhibit just down the hallway all about the T-Men. Um, and about bringing down Al Capone, which is obviously the centerpiece. Uh, remains, I think, the centerpiece of uh, what they've done. Um, so anyway, uh, with that, I just wanted to uh, thank you all for coming, and I'll turn this over to Paul. We can do some Q&A after he's completed uh, his presentation. Thank you. Okay. Um, hey, thank you for returning. That means a lot to me. Uh, and I know I ramble. I know. <laughs> um, so, make sure my... Oops! So, really what we've talked about is this tale of two leaders, right? We started off talking about the intelligence units and tale of two leadership styles. And, um, you know, where I left off was uh, World War II. And that... Uh, when we started this, this uh, last um, session, 1939, there were, there were reporters, very august reporters, that were saw, between the, saw the smoke and mirrors of Hoover. And it seemed like he, he was going to be challenged. And then World War II happened, and they, everybody thought, okay, he's the master spy catcher. And so he, he kept his Wizard of Oz status into 1945. And we still have the Hoover worshiping going on. And he did this through shameless self-promotion. And I found this interesting example of shameless self-promotion. They had these screen magazines, Army, Navy screen magazines, that they would do these uh, newsreels. And they would show to everybody in the military. I'm sure a lot of other people saw it. And I found one that was called The Battle of the United States, presented by J. Edgar Hoover. Oh, my God. And if you watch this, 
It plays to that whole G-Man campaign that I've talked about, where they were, they were the Dick Tracys. They were just like they were in the movies. And he taught, if you watch this, you think, oh my God, there are spies everywhere. There were spies everywhere, and they were just taking them down one by one, even though the, the eight spies that was captured in the submarine, they were kind of keystone. Remember when I told you they had to bring their own money to, to, uh, to do acts of sabotage. In fact, some of them, I think one or two, turned themselves in. And then it talked about his massive data collection. Now this is when Jager Hoover's collecting every data point. And he has this, these massive places where there's all these people working, collecting information. And it makes it sound like, oh my god, this is, this, this is absolutely critical. And that the crime labs, uh, you know, um, all this essential work they were doing. And look, I'm not discounting that. I am not discounting it. But if you watched it, it is the battle of the United States that was won by Jager Hoover. And he then says, hey, look, you need us because we keep America's secrets safe. Boy, that was very foretelling, huh, when he said that, safe for him. And he says at the end, he says, we, we at the FBI feel we are part of a team to make America great and decent place to live. What he failed to say as a team member was Treasury deprived all the Axis powers pretty much of essential funds to carry out terrorism. They had under watch and under monitoring, freezing monitoring, all the businesses that might be sympathetic to, to Axis powers. And that's what locked down, that played a big role. But hey, as a team member, he failed to mention that. Now, I think there was still some counterpunch going on by 1945. And in 1945, uh, this book came out. It was called The Giant Killers. Remember I told you that they were considered the giant killers. And... Um, when that book came out, it was widely reviewed by a lot of papers. So uh, the Chicago Tribune, one of the most efficient, if not the most spectacular law enforcement official of this era. It's talking about Elmer Ivey. This is Chicago Truman. Because the book, The Giant Killers, really was talking about Elmer Ivey and all these uh, and what they did. Uh, but the focus of the book was really Elmer Ivey. And uh, says Detroit Free Press. The intelligence unit today stands guard over rights, the rights and liberties of millions of men in the armed forces. Uh, the Winston-Salem Journal. For a decade, one of the most successful battles against crime in the United States has been waged not by a regular law enforcement agency, but by the team in of the United States Treasury. Malcolm News. The name of Elmer Army, who heads this alert agency, is almost unknown. There's that theme. Look, he's being unknown again, except in those circles which have had good reason to fear him. Then, this is telling. It says, Mr. J. Edgar Hoover has a flair for dramatizing the work of the Federal Bureau of Investigations <laughs> and remains on the good side of the press. Yes, his, his PR machine was working top, and that's, um, that's how he... Uh, he was, like I said, he still maintained that wizard status. Now, remember I brought up this journalist. He's a conservative columnist, kind of a curmudgeon type of guy, uh, Westbrook Pregular. But he exposed a lot of corruption. And one of, the, one of his big uh, exposés exposed that, uh, that scheme I talked about where it was this major organized crime leader that was leading a labor union, and that led to a case by CI. And he also wrote a lot about exposing all the corruption in baseball. He's a very big player in writing about, being pronounced uh, writing about baseball corruption. And it was right about that time, in 1945, that there was media reports that J. Edgar Hoover is interested in being one of the commissioners for baseball. And uh, there he is with Joe DiMaggio, and there's Walter Winchell. Remember the guy, Walter Winchell? He's right there. And it says, J. Edgar Hoover would be a hard-hitting baseball czar. The chief of the FBI let it become known that he was in the race recently when he said that the game has every right to go to Washington and find out just where it stands. Now remember, Westbrook Payton, and I'll, uh, he was the one that said, when they asked him, when he was writing all this about who should take over, who did he say was his recommendation? Elmer Irie. Elmer Irie was the one that he recommended. And all of a sudden, Jager Hoover's talking about it. Now, I don't know what came first, but it is interesting, you know, um, that it says Jager Hoover has been doing a, a big job rounding up saboteurs, spies, and other criminals. And the other, and it says, 
Um, the fact that the gangbuster, he's a gangbuster, that's what they're saying, hasn't had any practical baseball experience, shouldn't weigh too heavily. But again, this guy was the one that brought up all the corruption. When they asked him, according to the letter we found, he told Elmer, I told baseball that they should hire you. He said, I don't know what you know about uh, baseball, but if you, he told them, if Elmer ain't honest, there ain't no God. Now, 1945, we're getting out of World War II, and there's a catch-up period that the Treasury agents uh, need to catch up on the work that they couldn't do while they were uh, working, um, doing their part for World War II. And so you had all these war profiteers, you had all these black marketeers that I talked about, and the economy just greatly expanded. And now you had a much bigger tax base and there's a lot of cash flowing around. So they had to uh, really significantly increase the number of agents. They increased by 1,200 special agents. That's more than double their staff. And I bring that up because when that's how much of a skeleton crew they were. Um, and my point here is what happened under the cover of World War II. So you have the intelligence agency was going after all these gangsters, and uh, then World War II hits, and they're way down. And I think this is a significant point. What happens when there's not enough financial sleuth or criminal investigators going on? What could happen? Uh, now, Irie retires in 1946, and when he retired, this cartoon was printed in the Washington, uh, D.C. Star, and it's Uncle Sam looking at Elmer Irie, drawn as Sherlock Holmes. Can you imagine what Jager Hoover said when, when he saw it? And it says, and he's, and he's reading the complete work of Elmer Irie, 1907-1946, and he says, Elmer, I'd hate to close a record on this, even Sherlock Holmes would be proud of it. And then it has a little bear that shows all the cases that he's in. It was a Huey Long, Long Capone, on and on. That was not a good day for Elmer. And remember, he, remember I told you when he was asked to start this unit, they had, he's sick, they picked six people, and they were the uh, original leaders of the, of the unit. Only one retired. The rest stayed with him until he, and with uh, Elmer. And then you have this, and we have this display in the Mom Museum, Life Magazine does a profile on Elmer Irie. And that's a big deal when Life Magazine. And it says, I, Elmer Irie, boss of Treasure Teaman, was one of the world's greatest detectives. World's greatest detectives. And then if you look at this picture, Elmer had to have his picture uh, next to all these pictures of Lincoln. Remember, his name was Elmer Lincoln Irie, and he was a really big Lincoln fan. And there was a famous photo of Lincoln, a uh, painting of Lincoln above there. And Abraham Lincoln says, nearly all men can stand adversity, but if you want to test a man's character, give him power. Yeah. Right? Give him power. And who kept secret files in the pursuit of power? Yep. 1947, after Elmer retires, Hollywood finally decides to do a movie on the T-Men. It's called the T-Men. And, uh, excuse me for a second. And it's interesting, Elmer's uh, younger brother that Elmer helped raise because his dad left their family. And he helped raise his baby, uh, his uh, young siblings. Um, his name is Hugh Irie, and there he is on, on the left. <laughs> and uh, he became an IRS special agent, the intelligence unit, and he later becomes an LA police commissioner. And he totally idolized his brother, totally idolized. Uh, Irie passed in 1949, Treasury gave no formal recognition. And this is what I learned from talking to the family. Uh, it wasn't a big service, but it was, but all these people, all, he had so many friends and they came. And the pastor gets up there and he goes, look, I can go on and on about how all the stuff that he's done. Because I want to tell you one thing about Elmer. Because the last time I saw him was only a, a couple weeks ago and he handed me a check. You know why he handed me a check? Because he told me that if anybody needs anything, pastor, even if they don't go to our church, you take care of their needs and I'll give you a check. And that was the last thing that, that uh, Elmer did. And he wanted, the pastor's like, Elmer didn't want anybody to know this. You know, he was a deacon at the church, um, but he didn't want anybody to know it. And the pastor's saying, but I'm going to tell you, that's, that's the type of person Elmer was. 
Uh, before he died, his heart was failing, his friends convinced him to write a book, and he passed before the book got published. But it got published. But it got published. But, um, and if you read this, you got to spend maybe two or three hundred dollars to get this book now, maybe even more. When I started this story, well, you can get it for ten dollars, but uh, now, <laughs> but if you read that book, when I, I read that probably five, six years ago, and I was, didn't really know the whole story, but I was like, man, this guy, all he does is just give credit to all these other agents. You know, he's not taking credit for anything. And I, I, I was kind of getting irritated. I go, wait a minute, now, you, you were the one that did this. And it was like, no, I feel so good for me to say finally that this guy did this and this guy did this. And I was like, wow. And then I learned that that was his leadership style. He wrote that to give credit to everybody, all the agents that didn't get credit, what was going on. Now, it's interesting, one of the chapters in there is on Moses Annenberg. And that book was scheduled to be published during Christmas by Simon & Schuster. It was going to be huge. Well, guess who owns Simon & Schuster? Annenberg. And they read the book, and there was a chapter on Annenberg, and they said, we're not publishing it until you take that chapter out. And Elmer's sons, uh, one of which was Hugh uh, Irie, who was named after his, his uncle, they were both prominent doctors in this Maryland town, and they told the, the publisher, forget it. We'll find another publisher, but we're going to keep that chapter in to honor their dad. So they went with a smaller uh, publisher, much smaller, uh, didn't get the wide opening, and Simon & Schuster tried to keep that book out of all the, the bookstores. Now Elmer's gone, 1950. Uh, they have these House committee hearings. And they're talking about these Irish scandals by political appointees. And some of them were even doing deals with organized crime uh, to avoid taxes. And uh, it, was, it really was ugly. Um, and in 1950, remember this guy, Marcus Childs? He was the guy that wrote that article on Elmer Ivor, the nemesis nobody knows. He wrote that letter to him. Um, well, I'll talk a little bit later about that. But Remember, he's the Walter Cronkite of that time. Uh, and uh, he writes this article. It's called Integrity and Revenue Posts. And it's also, the subtitle is Days of Elmer Irie. And basically saying, man, we're really missing Elmer. You know, that talking about um, in the past, almost planning the, uh, the uh, you know, inf uh, implying that, um, you know, if we had Elmer around, this wouldn't happen. Uh, also during that time, there was this famous gang killing in the, in the uh, Democratic uh, headquarters in Kansas City, a mob boss. And there was all this, people were, and the media was just uh, reporting about all this gang activity. And uh, that led to what, uh, uh, what we call the Kefauver hearings. And there was so much concern that by the American public that organized crime had reared its head again. And a Congress, and it got political because they had somebody murdered in a DNC office, and then there was also allegations of what was going on the, on the Republican side. So they have this hearing. It was led by Senator Kefauver, and we, and the second floor, we do this whole thing on the Kefauver hearing. So I'm going to tell you things that they don't tell you in there uh, to give you a little context of what happened. Uh, now the Kefauver hearing was so popular that movie theaters showed it. It was more popular than the. Uh, than the Super Bowl. Uh, if you ran a blood bank and you weren't televising the Key Farfer hearing, nobody was going to give blood. So they had to show it while they were giving uh, blood. And um, there's this great dynamic. This, this thing was the great dynamics. So Jager Hoover, he was so focused on going after communists that, you know, he was saying organized, syndicate, national syndicate organized crimes, they don't exist. But what you're seeing is just local criminals. It's not, it's not the Bureau's problem. But Harry Anslinger, who was the Bureau of Narcotics Director, he was like, no way. And they, this was a public battle between these two guys. Harry Anslinger was the first to collect intel on the mafia. And he was sharing it with all law enforcement. And he uh, was under the leadership of Elmer Ivory and a Anslinger, um, had a lot of respect for Elmer Irie, but there's this battle that's going on publicly between these guys. They both have to testify. Now, Hank Messick, he is one of the preeminent authorities on organized crime during that time. He's not alive now, but he wrote several books. A lot of people quote him, and I'm going to quote him. Uh, 
And in his book called The Secret Fibers, he says, the key fiber can be made the most penetrating probe ever conducted of the links between organized crime and politicians. It was successful largely because the president signed an executive order giving the committee the right to examine income tax returns and other information uh, of the files of the IRS. He gave them, they did it, what, you, you can't do that. You have to get a presidential order to disclose all these tax returns. And every witness that came up there, they had their tax returns. You know what they did? They MRI read everyone. They componed everyone. And it says, armed with income tax reports made available to them by the President Truman himself, the committee grilled every sheriff and police executive they could find. It was not a pretty show because the, remember when I told you what organized crime does? It's corruption. It's not the time again, but corruption. And the... And they were having uh, big problems for, uh, with corruption uh, rearing its ugly head again, including law, local law enforcement. And the committee, one of the findings, says these organized crime, they frequently attempt to insulate themselves uh, from direct attack by operating through a maze of corporation, corporations, dummy stockholders and fronts. Remember we talked about that in World War II? And go, uh, you know, how the Nazis were using front companies. It's a, it's a common scheme for money laundering. So this is what they did. They said, IRS, go form these racket squads. And they were made up of IRS criminal, civil auditors, civil collectors. And I think they also work with local police too. And they had a, a list of 30,000 people who were known or suspected corrupt officials or organized crime members. And they audit the heck out of everybody. <laughs> and through that, oh, and during the key fire hearing, they relied on a lot of people, uh, uh, they li relied on a lot of people from IRIS criminal investigation. And our first presentation, I talked about a man by the name of A.P. Madden. He was a special agent in charge of the Chicago field office. He played an integral role in the Capone case. He also played an integral role uh, helping on the Lindbergh, and he played an integral role on the, um, the Annenberg case. Well, he's still working with the IRS, and this is what the committee said about Madden. The enormous task at which the committee has been uh, entrusted would, would be that much more difficult of success, uh, excuse me, successful fulfillment without Madden. So he's even cited in, in the in the Kefauver for hitting reports. And he was under Elmer Irie's leadership, and Elmer mentored this person to be a, a really strong leader. Now, if you go down and watch our exhibit, you have this guy, Frank Costello, mobster. He says, they ask him, what's the most, what, what can you be, what are you proud of? And then he says, I pay my taxes. Now, we need to edit that video down there because uh, he didn't pay his taxes. And this is how they found it. They started investigating this guy and this is how good they got on financial sleuthing. One of the, he's going through checks and he sees this, um, this $5.10 uh, check the wife makes to a, uh, to a nursery. And then he's looking and he goes, wait a minute, that nursery is, specializes in, um, for uh, cemeteries. So he tracked down the nursery and found out what's in the cemeteries near it. Then he finds out that, wait a minute, Costello bought a plot for uh, almost $5,000 in cash there. Then he started digging more and he found out all these, um, these uh, contractors were, were building this opulent uh, marble mausoleum there and he just kept on drilling, drilling down and he found all these expenditures just by indirectly, well, actually directly following the money. And he got a five-year tax evasion. And then Mickey Cohen during this time. He, there's movies about Mickey Cohen, but he went to jail for 11 years in tax evasion. And here's some of the other people that went that got t charged uh, for tax evasion during this time: Albert Anastasia, Joe Adonis. These are big-time gangsters. Albert's uh, his woman, Pete Licoviti, uh, Detroit Purple Gang, and then. In the, uh, going into the late 50s and the 60s, there's a Senate Labor Racket Committee, McClellan hearing. Guess who was helping on that one? And they started using tax evasion again. They take down David Beck, president of the International Brotherhood of Teamsters. They take down Richard Gosser, vice president of the International United Workers Union. 
They take down Johnny Deal, mobster of uh, Hoffie associate. Now this is when late 50s, 60s, Hoover's like, okay, I gotta start working gangsters. And we need intelligence. So what does he do? He puts in all these illegal wires. <laughs> now those wires gain incredible intel, but that evidence was inadmissible. And Elmer and their, the, 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 that unit never did the illegal wiretapping. Their, all their evidence was, uh, was admissible. Continue, Sam Battaglia, 15 years. He was part of the outfit. In the 1960s, more than 60% of organized crime cases were prosecuted by the small little intelligence unit, IRS criminal investigations. And on April 13, 1962, uh, Bobby Kennedy goes to the special agent, IRS special agent basic training school, and he does the, uh, the graduation speech. And he says, a lot of the success we've had in dealing with organized crime is due to the Treasury Department and all the efforts that have been made. The intelligence division carries the brunt of them, uh, having been very successful and very effective. 1959 to 1963, there's the Untouchable TV show. Remember we talked about that and how everybody thinks that it's just Elliot Ness. Elliot Ness, and this is why, this is how it started. This sh TV show was widely impossible. Now think about it. What they were getting in the 1950s and 60s from uh, the media was all these gangsters going down by Treasury, not FBI. So they weren't going to make a show about FBI when they wanted to talk about gangsters because the, me the media started, you know, was reporting that it was Treasury. So, um, and Oscar Fairley wrote that book, The Untouchables, and I'm like, this is great. So, Jager Hoover was pissed by this because they were taking credit for his cases too. Um, Just don't stop. Go back to the, the guy on the far left over there. Yeah. Oh, okay. We got some gossip that this gentleman's going to tell me after. Now I can't. Now I'm going to go real fast because I want to. I want to know what this gossip is. Uh, now Frank Wilson, he retires as uh, in 1947 as the chief of Secret Service. Remember, he was the one that uh, revolutionized Secret Service, um, counterfeit investigations, and protecting the president. And he was the Capone agent who worked for Elmer Irie. And he becomes famous unto himself, and he's just so livid about the untouchables that he writes this, uh, he, he actually writes this script, and it was all about this, uh, on, the, on the life of Mike Malone. Remember, he was the undercover agent on Capone and all these big un undercover investigations, and Elmer Irie and, and uh, Frank Wilson idolized Mike Malone. They just, you know... It's like they almost had a man crush and how, how you know, what, he was, he was the man in there, but it never happened. During this time, Jager Hoover's getting more, you know, we're in the 60s, people are starting to see what's going on, and he's, his Wizard of Oz status is being revealed, they've seen the smoke and mirrors, and guess who that, around that time starts the J. Hoover, J. Edgar Hoover Foundation? Lewis Nichols. Lewis Nichols was member number three, and during the 1930s he ran the, uh, the FBI media campaign. I showed you a letter, the scathing letter that he sent Time Magazine for how dare they write an a article comparing Elmer Irie, putting him on a pedestal, and, and making comments derogatory comments about Jager Hoover. Um, he starts the Jager Hoover Foundation in 1965. Still, you, I go to the webpage, it's still around. But uh, it's interesting, they're protect, they, they're, it's keeping his legacy alive. Remember, I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk about legacy a little bit more. And it was the image, it was a Hollywood image of that legacy that they were trying to keep alive. Um, 1970, Richard Nixon starts a war on drugs, and one of his first acts was to give Elvis Presley a DEA badge. <laughs> he really did. <laughs> <laughs> and the idea, though, was, uh, hey, we're going we're gonna to use IRS criminal to go, um, to go after tax evasion cases. And right about that time, there's this law that came into being that... Uh, it's called the Currency Transaction Reports. 
So if you go to a bank and you deposit 10000 in a withdrawal, $10,000 in cash you have to file, or more, you have to file a currency transaction report, that's when it started. And why they were doing that? It was to give the team in, the IRS, uh, evidence of cash and, uh, and to go after the underground economy, but also go after, you know, these gangsters. And they started, IRS criminals started working gangs, like, such as the Hells Angels, started building tax evasion cases during that time. June 1972 was not a good year for Richard Nixon, a good month. Um, There's a Watergate scandal, we all familiar with that. And what they found was, hey, these U.S. corporations were giving money to the secret slush fund, and that's how they funded these operatives. So they're like, well, let's go investigate. Let's get the IRS folks, and let's have them financial sleuth in those slush funds. Well, you know what they found? They found, like, uh, it's not just, this, not just funding these guys to break in. They were funding all these bribe payments to, to uh, countries around the world to do business. They found out that they, they discovered over $400 million of money laundered through these slush accounts to get con government contracts. Companies like Lockheed, Golf, McDonnell Douglas, and this is work, a lot of it was done by the Treasury agents uh, following the money. Uh, and they were, these foreign corporations were involved in all types of mobster uh, type of uh, Money laundering, foreign bank accounts, couriers of bags of cash, front companies, bogus expenses. They literally had people delivering bags of cash uh, to uh, corrupt officials. And again, who played a critical role in following that money? That later, all that later led to what's called uh, Foreign Corrupt Practice Acts, where now it's illegal to, to, uh, to donate or to give uh, bribes. During this time, IRS criminal was deep involved in a corruption investigation of the number two in the country, Spiro Agno. And so they were doing the Watergate, and then they also had the VP under investigation. Now that ultimately led to the vice president pleading to tax evasion, but, and people say, well, it was just a small tax evasion. No, they had this whole case on this epic corruption graph that the vice president was involved in before he became president. Hoover passes away, 1972. There's a building named after him. It's still in existence today. <coughs> and my point here, and the reason why I bring up uh, Hoover is that I don't think you can tell the story of Elmer or tell the story of Jago Hoover without talking about both individuals. Because we have to remember, up to 1945, Jago Hoover had a contemporary that did was far better a law enforcement leader, had far better, far more respect. Um, and uh, remember, Elmer grew up as a criminal investigator. Jager Hoover grew up as a librarian and an attorney. But, um, but that said, I do feel that when you have comp what does competition do to you? It makes you better. What do you think? I truly think that this is a dynamic. If Elmer wasn't around, what would, you know, because everybody was comparing. You know, they were comparing the two. So I do feel Elmer raised the bar for Jager Hoover. 1997, the intelligence unit is turned in, is, the names change, and it's called IRS Criminal Investigation. And they played a big role getting the mob out of Las Vegas. Here's some of their successes. 28 years, John Cerrone. Joe Lombardo, the clown, Joe Lomb uh, the clown. <laughs> Rocco in Infilesi. Um, this is a, a, one of the, uh, just a cruel Capone-like outfit uh, crew leaders in Chicago that was taken down by IRS criminal investigation. Great case. Uh, Russian mob kin, kingpin in, um, a big Russian mob kingpin in New York. Michael Franzisi, we've had actually had Talks, he too went down on tax evasion. And the front page back during that time uh, talked about John, Cotty, uh, John Gotti also getting convicted of tax evasion. As they worked on money laundering, follow the money, they led to uh, working with the DEA, this guy, um, the president of Panama, <laughs> Manuel Noriega, gets indicted, charged with money laundering. Rob Blagojevich, tax evasion. Actually, let me take that back. That was worked by the IRS and FBI, but the IRS, the lead agent on the case was an IRS agent. And uh, it, they, IRS played a critical role on that. Uh, Rodrigo, you ever watch Narcos? 
If you know, it's a great series. Well, after Pablo Escobar, there was these Rodriguez brothers. They controlled the Cali cartel, and um, they eventually went down on money laundering charges, and the government seized uh, two billion dollars from them. Congressman Randy Duke Cunningham, corruption, tax evasion. Congressman Jesse Jackson Jr., tax evasion. The Detroit mayor, tax evasion. And then Whitey Bulger. This is what people don't realize, Whitey Bulger. The, 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 the key, the lead agent during trial that was sitting next to the prosecutors was an IRS agent. And she put, she was able by the money, by following the money, to link all the conspirators, and that's how they were able to put together the RICO case. And if it wasn't for her, the Whitey Bulger would not have been able to be convicted on the RICO statutes for murder and money laundering. She played an integral role. El Chapo also worked with DA, money laundering. And Silk Rose, is, there's this, uh, there was this drug bazaar on the internet that was gaining traction, and all these illegal drugs, and the government was having a hard time. They could not find who this guy was, and it was an IRS agent. The Wall Street Journal uh, wrote about this. A lot of people wrote about this. One agent was able to track that person down, and that's how they discovered the, 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 the guy that ran that whole thing. FIFA case that was broken by an IRS. This guy right here, yeah, I'm a tax evader because that's how they found him. And that's how they got him to cooperate, all by following the money. He looks enormous in that picture. <laughs> uh, and this is the thing. When Elmer was working these cases back then, over 90% of their cases led to prosecution. And that over 90% prosecution rate continued up to this time. 90%. So if you get, if you get charged... Uh, your odds aren't good. <laughs> and, and this is where I lead to the, the forgotten story um, and the role that uh, the Mom Museum helped, really helped me in trying to discover the story. Um, so as I was trying to find this story, find more information, I tracked down Elmer Irie's family. And one in particular is Carol Gridley, right on the left. She's the granddaughter of Elmer Irie. She was supposed to be Elmer Irie Jr., but she became a girl. <laughs> and she said, hey, I asked if there's any type of thing, any documents that would help me understand his leadership and his role. And they said, you know, let me go. She went through, all, went to, uh, coordinated, talking to all the family. And she says, look, Paul, we found a bunch of documents. And... Um, we want to donate them um, and, and let the world know, you know, about Elmer Ivory. And I said, don't donate them to the government because then nobody will get it. And I said, you know who would love to have that collection is the Mob Museum. And uh, Mob Museum uh, actually paid for all the money for, uh, for all these documents to be uh, dig digitized and uh, work with the family. And we obtained the Elmer Ivory collection. And we didn't know what we were getting. She didn't tell me the letters. Uh, we were, uh, they just sent a DVD to us with all the documents. And I got one and Jonathan got one. And when I got it, I was at my desk drinking a beer. And I'm going through them because, uh, and I'm like, wait a minute. This looks like an original letter from FDR. And wait a minute. This looks like an original letter from Charles Lindbergh. Wait a minute. These are original letters from Henry J. Morgenthau, the Treasury Secretary. So I called up Jonathan and I said, I think we're getting these original documents that people have talked about in history books. And Jonathan's like, no way, Paul. Those are just copies. And I go, they didn't have photoc photocopiers back then. Uh, but, uh, and when we finally got the box, and when I say Jonathan, he's the uh, president of the Mob Museum, back there in the corner grading me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I did call him 10 times of that. And um, um, we found original autograph pictures from presidents, Hoover, FDR, 
even Harry Truman, and hundreds of letters from senior government officials and law enforcement leaders, none from Jager Hoover though. <laughs> Homer Cummings was the Attorney General serving, uh, longest serving uh, Attorney General under uh, FDR, and he was Hoover's boss, Jager Hoover's boss. And he says in his letter, in my judgment, no one has rendered more distinguished public service than you have. I, found, I thought that was pretty epic, finding that one. Edward Ford, the Undersecretary, Undersecretary of the Treasury. This is World War II. All these secretary folks played a key role. You set the highest standards of public service in enforcing fearlessly and impartially the revenue laws of the United States. Stephen Springer, the Deputy Attorney and later becomes the federal trade, uh, head of the Federal Trade Commission. You have I have particularly admired the selflessness with which you have carried on your work, avoiding the notable opportunities which they might have afforded another sort of man for self-glorification and concentrated only on doing the job. We all know who he's comparing him to, right? Self-glorification. And this guy also was Jager Hoover's boss for one time. Harold Graves, the Undersecretary of Treasury, played a key role in the war bonds, key person during the World War II. I am sure that the highest standards of honors and integrity which always govern your actions and the outstanding efficiency which you have and your, which you and your force uh, uniformly discharge, I can't even read, uh, your difficult duties, have left an influence upon federal law enforcement which will survive long after the money banks are dead and forgotten. And it's true, his legacy did survive. He also says, your readiness to obscure or sacrifice yourself at all times for the good of the service took the sharp edge from many a crisis that we faced in that period. That was World War II that he was dealing with. That selfless sacrifice. Harold, Gr Harold Gaston, big, also a big player in the Treasury. Some of us know, as all Americans ought to know, that the success of the tax system on which the strength of our democratic government depends is due in great part to your work and that of the fine organizations you built, preserved and defended. I found that pretty epic too. And Oliver Max Gardner, North Carolina governor, who's a former uh, Undersecretary of Treasury, thanks for the tireless and un selfish way in which you serve your country. Here's another governor, the governor of Chicago, excuse me, of uh, Illinois. Uh, and one of the only, one of the few governors that was never indicted. <laughs> and, uh, uh, and he was also the, uh, one of the lead prosecutors on the Capone case, by the way. And he says, I feel that the people of our country owe you a great debt of gratitude. Remember Marcus Childs? Marcus Childs and Walter Cronkite. He says, your long and distinguished service is an occasion for pride, not al alone to your family and wide circle of friends, but to everyone who believes in effective, honest government. I found that so powerful from a man that won a Pulitzer Prize in commentary and very well respected. And James Bennett, Bureau of Director of Prisons. This is one of my favorite letters. Things are going to be at a pretty pass for me when I lose my best talent scout. <laughs> You've really kept us busy for so many years that I won't know what to do when you actually go into your richly deserved retirement. Yeah, and then we found a bunch of letters, all hundreds of letters from all these agents, special agents. There was Mike Malone, the great undercover agent. There was Frank Wilson, Bill Frank. He was the guy that that uh, the financial wizard that that worked on the Lindbergh case. He was the one that brought down Nucky Johnson. Nels Tenman. He was the lead agent on Annenberg. He was also on the Capone agent. Hugh McQuillan, he ran the New York office, worked with uh, Thomas Dewey, led that huge New York drive of uh, 
gangsters and corruption. Larry O'Lean, he was the guy, he was one of their top gangster slayers, but during World War II was asked to be uh, an administrator for the U.S. savings bond, pro war bond program, and he played a critical role in that, ef that effort. Paul Snyder, he was one of the uh, Nucky Johnson Boardwalk Empire agents, and he says this, on many occasions, your confidence in our ultimate success represented the only incentive to continue in the face of obstacles which appear insurmountable. Remember, they, that case, they tried to get Nucky for 25 years, but he owned everybody in that town. And they had dark times trying to take this case down. And this letter to me is so powerful, what the atmosphere of uh, Elmer's leadership. Alf Otelda, he's the agent that saved Hollywood. Remember, the outfit was, gonna, was, uh, was about ready to take 50% of the Hollywood by controlling the labor ra uh, rackets. <laughs> he says, Emerson has observed that men of character are the conscious of a society to which they belong. How true is this as evidenced by your outstanding influence among special agents? He's quoting Emerson. Uh, when, <laughs> And talking about what Elmer has done, James Oliver, he's one of the Capone agents. Few men can look back upon achievements comparable to yours. Fewer can, can do so with the satisfying realizations that they gave full credit to all members of their organization who had part in those achievements. Now this is a powerful leadership uh, uh, teaching point. That when you want to empower your agents or your employees, don't steal their achievements. Give them credit. Be selfless. And this was the essence of what Irie did. Clifton Mack. We talked a lot about Clifton Mack World War II. He was the one that was the director of procurement. He played a critical role in getting supplies to, Brit to Britain, to Soviet Union. Uh, he made government efficient when it came to um, procurement during World War II. And Henry J. Morgenthau said of him, there was no, there was no graph during that time when Cliff, and he says, I have always had a very pleasant recollection of the number of young folks who stopped by to visit you, and I noticed particularly that they invariably called you Uncle Elmer. I soon learned it was an expression of close friendship and desire to feel free to discuss their personal problems with you. They were calling him Uncle Elmer. It was a younger agent's, you know, he, um, and, and secretary, and it, and it says, that made a very strong impression upon me for the reason that the best evidence, to my mind, of, it, of individual success is the estimation and respect others feel towards him. There is no more convincing test than that. Elmer had an incredible influence on Mac as a leader. And he saw that and he applied that same leadership skill set and he achieved great things uh, in contributing to the success of World War II. And this letter, I'll leave with this letter. It's a letter, it's one of my favorite letters. It's a secretary of pool of Elmer. And by this time, Elmer is a big wig in treasury, right? And, um, and he says, not one of us can recall a day when you weren't always willing to lend a helping hand, nor can we recall that you have ever been anything but our smiling Mr. Irie. It's like somebody pulled out of a Norman Rockwell painting, right? Who's like this? <laughs> There's this, the Greeks, is it the Romans? Oh, it's, the Greeks have the saying, character is destiny. Character is destiny. Hoover got a movie. That was his destiny. He got a movie. Now, was that movie fair? Probably not. And what did Elmer get? <laughs> we gave him Elmer Irie Day. How am I doing on time? Can I? Okay. We gave him Elmer Irie Day. When we found all this and we started, and the chief of criminal investigation, Rich Weber, he, he, we were competing on who was going to be the, the most fanatical Elmer fan. And he decided to have Elmer Irie Day because he, Treasury never formally recognized Elmer Irie. And we invited, it was up to, it was 47 descendants of the Elmer Irie family came. And 
there's some of this, there's me with the, you know, some of the, the Chief Weber, the family, and we did this presentation. They established the Elmer Irie Lincoln Distinguished Service Award, and the first award went to the, to the family. And here were the granddaughters uh, that were instrumental in getting all these records together. And actually, one of them was alive when, before Elmer passed, and she wrote this letter to us just talking about, you know, the influence he had on the family and how, you know, all we heard was, Elmer never talked about what he did, but he, he just, he was just so involved in his family. And we had the granddaughter, Carol Gridley, give a speech about Elmer. And here's the interesting thing. When I first contacted Carol, and I told, I, it, I was on the phone with her, and it was about 10 minutes of me just saying, and your, and your grandfather did this, and your grandfather did this. And she paused, and she says, I had no idea. All she knew was they called him Poppy, and he had this epic influence on the family. And uh, her dad and her uncle, the two sons of Elmer, they became these prominent people in the, in the community, these two doctors, and all they can do is talk about Elmer Irie. They, had, they just loved and idolized uh, the father. Um, and it, was, it brought tears to us. We're listening to this legacy. And the legacy, when you think about it, was, and way more important to Elmer, was his family legacy. It wasn't the legacy. He didn't care if there wasn't a building named after him. This is what he meant most to him. And so, just like in The Wizard of Oz, there's this happy entity where Dorothy realizes, you know, the family. And there's no place like home. And to Elmer, that's what it was. There was no place like home. And that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. <laughs>